my name is Thomas, and if there's any one place in the world that I could claim its spot as the birthplace of my James Bond fandom, for the movies at least, it would be here. The fourth floor of Brent Cross Shopping Centre, the car park, by column E. This is where the best car chase in the whole of the James Bond films takes place, with James Bond controlling the car from his mobile phone in the back seat. Back seat driver. I absolutely love that scene. I think it has the thrill, the joy. It comes right after one of the most emotional scenes as James Bond's former love, Paris Carver, is brutally murdered and he, of course, exacts some small measure of revenge. And then we just belt into the fun bit here as he fights off all the villains in their blue blazers and charcoal coloured slacks. Well, I do like that look. I never got the memo about that being a villain look, but this really is the birthplace of my love for the movies. This just had the joy, the joy that the movies rarely have. Okay, so now I am back at home. I've changed. I'm wearing my three-button charcoal suit. Uh, this was a bespoke suit. I chose the fabric, I chose all the details because, well, I wanted to match the suit uh, that Pierce Brosnan wears in the Hamburg scenes. It doesn't have the cut, that is my tailor's cut, as I don't live in the 1990s, but I just love the style. And yes, it's the Turnbull and Asser tie that he wears. This was my, I think my first uh, James Bond kind of brand purchase, not inspired, not, you know, loosely copied from this is the tie from Turnbull and Asser and I was delighted to get it as I say to have a whole outfit because I guess that's my favorite scene from overall my favorite Bond film from at least the modern era by which I mean post 1990. I haven't just watched the film uh, I have also read the book of the film by Raymond Benson the novelization which really fleshes out uh, Waylin's character and also goes into the backstories for the villains, Elliot Carver and Stamper. I've also been reading a book that uh, I'd highly recommend by Matthew Field and A.J. Chowdhury called Some Kind of Hero. That gives an insight into the troubled production of this film in particular. It actually covers a wide range of the Bond films from the first until the time of production. It's a really good book. It does give fantastic details into the making of but even the official making of book, which is normally, you know, lush photographs and uh, a bit of padding, even the official one by Garth Pierce goes into details about what a problematic shoot it was. The script just wasn't ready. There were issues between actors. There were technical issues all throughout. And yes, injury to the main star, Pierce Brosnan. It was problematic to say the least. But if you're a Star Wars fan, you'll be aware that the original 1977 Star Wars film was beset by disaster, and yet the end result is almost universally recognized as amazing, outstanding, and it was the highest grossing film in cinema history until Titanic was released, actually in the same year as Tomorrow Never Dies. Also in the same year, was the election of Tony Blair and the famous Sun newspaper headline, it was the Sun that won it. Rupert Murdoch's media empire claimed responsibility for the result of the largest landslide in British electoral history, which kind of neatly tied into the film, made many people think that the villain was really supposed to be Rupert Murdoch. Of course, there is a comment at the end about the luxury yacht that had a lot of people believe that the main character was Maxwell, and again, even the making of book does reference uh, Maxwell wanting to wear the same thing every day, so Carver wears pretty much the same outfit all throughout. Now, I think Carver is a fantastic villain. I think he's one of the best villains in the franchise, and again, the best modern villain. And I think that the performance by Jonathan Price is outstanding. Some people find it a bit too much. He's a bit too out there, but he's a media mogul. We see him performing. In fact, it's probably got the only scene in the whole of Bond where I have sympathy for the Bond wanting to explain his evil plan to everybody. He's questioned and says, but it's my, it's my business. It's who he is, it's what he is. Raymond Benson's book has him as the uh, illegitimate son of Lord Roverman, which I think is really interesting. I'm slightly glad they cut that. It's a little too close to Lord Rothermere, who of course owns the Daily Mail. A bit of Bond history, uh, Ian Fleming ultimately married the wife 
of uh, Lord Rothermere back then, and of course has been given a very hard time by the press ever since. It has been said that if there's one lesson to be learned from Ian Fleming's life, it's uh, don't steal the wife of the owner of the Daily Mail, which is a very, very specific life lesson, but a good life lesson nonetheless. As I say, I really like Jonathan Price in this role, frightening, mad, but we also see his uh, introspective moments as well, and the performance is quite different there. I also very much enjoy the performance by Terry Hatcher, star in her own right. She was kind of argued for by one of the American executives at uh, United Artists. So the Americans wanted an American star in this film, a bit of name recognition, help it sell in the US, but she was very popular here in the UK. In fact, she'd been listed in the top 10 sexiest women in the world by For Him magazine several times, and I believe topped the poll during the making of this film. So she was popular on both sides of the uh, Atlantic, and I think really brings a lot of heart to those scenes. Some people suggest that maybe there could be a bit more romance between Bond and Wei Lin. Light spoilers, there's a beautiful girl and there's James Bond, so, you know, some people say it comes out of nowhere. But I think to have uh, you know, a meaningless fling on both sides of the equations there kind of balances out the heartfelt romance uh, with the uh, Elliot Carver's wife, Paris. Again, I think it's a really good character because for me, I've always got the sense that uh, she enjoyed the adventure with Bond at some point in the past. Bond left her, she's heartbroken, and so she kind of goes to the other end of the spectrum. She looks for safety. What better safety than the most powerful man in the world, Elliot Carver? And that, uh, again, light spoilers, does not have a happy result. So Bond feels some kind of guilt, and there is reference later on. Not to say the film dwells on it, it's not that kind of film. Again, just to, uh, to make the comparison to the Star Wars films, you know, we see Princess Leia's planet blow up. We don't have a huge amount of reference to it later. We're a lot more concerned about the characters, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi and so on. And we do have reference to the planet being blown up later on, but it doesn't dwell on it. And I kind of put the tone of Tomorrow Never Dies pretty well in that kind of Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, maybe not Return of the Jedi, that has some lighter moments, but I think uh, Tomorrow Never Dies has some great, great moments all throughout. This is probably my favorite modern Bond not so much on the Fleming angle. Most of my other favorites will draw on Fleming. This film was made very much in the, the wake of uh, Cubby Broccoli's passing by his, uh, you know, by his children, uh, Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli. And this is very much in tribute to uh, what Cubby Broccoli brought to the character. So whilst I normally prefer the more Fleming-ish films, this feels very much like an, an ode to Cubby Broccoli. And for me, this is peak cinematic James Bond. If I was to show somebody one James Bond film who had never ever seen it and wanted to know what's all this fuss about, I would probably show them this. This has the, the glamour, it has the locations, it has a bit of heart and also a bit of lightness. This is a sweet distraction for an hour or two. And I feel very much that Michael G. Wilson and Barbara Broccoli remembered the first rule of mass media. They give the audience what we want. I think it was a great film, again, only added to by the Raymond Benson novelization. And for me, reading about the troubled production actually only makes me like it all the more. So this is my favorite Pierce Brosnan Bond film. <laughs>